Welcome to the Ink Pulp Podcast. I'm your lovely host, Sean Crystal. Thank you for tuning in again. If you're a repeat tuner inner, uh, if you're new to this podcast, thank you for listening. Please take a minute to head on over to Farside TV on YouTube and subscribe over there. Or if you're on Twitch, do what you got to do over there. Or Mixcloud, do what you got to do over there. Uh, or go to FarsideTV.com. They stream these episodes. Um, I premiere the episodes on their streaming platforms. Then I release them on my platforms. So if you go to uh, youtube.com slash inkpulp and hit subscribe. And if you're watching it, wherever you're watching it, hit like, comment. Uh, and when when this is live, I've been real diligent about um, on Wednesdays being a part of the live stream. So I'm there in the chat room uh, if you've got any questions. On my channel, subscribe, like, comment, do all that good stuff. Trying to build our followers. Uh, trying to grow this stuff. And then follow me on, on all my social media platforms, at Inkpol, Instagram, Twitter. You got a Facebook page and uh, TikTok, although I'm not terribly active there. I'm still not sure what I'm doing on there. I'm an old man on TikTok. What can I say? Uh, so, uh, yeah, thank you. Welcome back. I'm going to talk a little bit about balance today because it's an area I'm not proficient in. I tend to overload myself with, um, I don't like to call it work because it's, it's, I mean, it is in the, uh, you know, pure definition sense, but my work is, is my passion, it's my love, it's my joy, and I tend to take on too much, and I think that just comes from ambition. I have a lot I want to do, and where I am in life, uh, I, th I had a lot I was hoping I would have accomplished by now, so it's kind of created this backlog of stuff I still want to do. And uh, I just kind of get lost, like in the forest, can't see the forest of the trees, um, just constantly burying myself for a brighter future <laughs> when, when I can chill more, when I can work at a more reasonable pace. But what I am aware of and what I'm learning and what I'm really trying to be better at is instead of living for a dream life in the future, live that way now. And honestly, some downtime, uh, some time to decompress only makes you perform better now, makes your art stronger now. And that's an abstract thought. I mean, I was just raised to think, work hard, work hard, work hard, and you'll succeed. And there's something to be said for downtime. And that's something I'm really working on, and I'm really not good on it. But what I realize is, like, you have a certain amount of mental space. It's like, this is your hard drive. And when I'm working on a project, my, my gray matter is, is, is working shit out when I'm not hands-on. So... If I'm working on a project, like say the one with the far side, when I'm at the gym or when I'm laying down at night about to fall asleep, my gray matter is just kind of working out some problems. But then I've got this um, instructional, like how to draw comics video line I'm launching, or I guess, yeah, when this comes out, I'll be launching it very shortly after. And that's called Ink Pulp Instruction. And that's a big business thing for me. I mean, I, I want to grow that thing to be massive. Uh, and the Farside Project's growing to be massive. So then my hard drive is starting to get clogged. 
and things stop working. It's like gears start grinding to a slower speed. And um, it, I, I start to feel this frustration. And I, it took me decades to figure out what this frustration is. And it's that there's too much going on. Then on top of that, I'm starting another dream project. This time, Killer Mike and Cuz Lightyear. And that's another massive, massive undertaking. These three projects are my dreams come true. And these three projects are my future. So now I've got all three of them gumming me up. And I'm not taking the downtime I need. And I'm not... It's creating a, a fuzz where I'm usually very focused. When I come into the studio during the day, it's a lot of scrambling to keep everything afloat. And really not... <clears throat> getting a, a feel that I'm taking them one at a time and getting them like working them out healthy and putting them back it's more panicky and that, that's not a good place to work from so I know I know my weakness here and, and this is what I got to work on I know I talk a lot about you know trying to uplift and move forward and strengths and successes I've had but I think it's important today to talk about uh, where I'm not succeeding and where I need to succeed so uh, you can see my thought process and how I need to learn to hold myself more accountable for these things um, but I do have that grind mentality like just go 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 and muscle through everything but there is a a, a severe downside to that you will break um, you have to be strategic in in your energy use and you have to place your energies in proper areas so balance see balance gotta remind myself all right enough about that um and you know leave a comment down below let's talk about this shit um and also this is another another big thing on that so when my balance is out of whack my frequency, which vibes high, I'm talking about that, dips. That's that's really bad. That's really bad. So just by taking some downtime, you can keep your your frequency vibing high. That's the key. That's the key. Um, all right. So today on the Ink Pulp podcast, uh, we have my man Jim Mafood, as always, kind of like my co-host. Uh, Jim comes on when he can, and every time he does, I feel like he adds so much to the show, and the show is, is um, just better with him. No doubt. No doubt at all. He brings a lot to the table, and we have a good time. And then Alan. I know, like, a few of you have been noticing, like, I'll, I'll like, make a mental note for Alan, like, on, not a mental note, but I'll make a note, like, Alan, right here, drop this in. And he, he's, he doesn't always do it. Well, Al, here's the thing. Alan, Alan's a busy, busy man, just like myself. I mean, he's got a full-time teaching gig. And we, he's also very involved in my uh, ink pulp instruction business. Uh, we're kind of partners in that. And uh, he's got a bunch of projects of his own. He's like, he's of the same ilk as me. I mean, he just overloads himself. So this podcast is another thing he does with me. It makes... It doesn't make us money, but he puts a lot of time into it. So he, at times, will just, you know, not listen to the whole episode and just put it through the system and let it do its work. And it's playing in the background while he's working, and he won't might not pick up on everything. So be easy on Alan, because without him, this doesn't happen. So much love and respect, Alan. So we got Mafu. Uh, Alan's always involved. And today we got Jim Rugg. Uh, Jim Rugg is a fellow comic book artist, um, someone who's been very inspiring to me as of late. As you know, I've really switched my mind to being a completely independent artist, and I'm, and I'm paying much more attention to those artists that have been successful at that and learning from them, and Jim is one of them. And he just had a Kickstarter for his book called Octo Brianna. And we talk about that today, and we're drawing Octo Brianna. I don't want to say much more about Octo Brianna, but you can get copies. I highly recommend it. It's the first, the first black light comic ever made. It's kind of cool. 
So check that out. Uh, I got nothing else for you people. I think we're good. I think we've got, I know we've got a killer episode today. So sit back, kick back, relax, and enjoy this episode of the Ink Pulp Podcast. And keep your eyes peeled, Ink Pulp Instruction. Probably within a week or two from you hearing this, it's going to be all over the place. My Indiegogo campaign for the first video. I'll say more. Just follow me on social media. All the teasers, all the explanations, everything will be there. It's going to be gangster shit. So thanks again. Enjoy. Peace. Yeah, this, this post office thing is going to be a mess. Um, uh, although, Jim, I, I will, both of you guys, your books arrived bright, or bright and early, easily. I had no problem with them. So, I mean, this is going to be so confusing when you're like, Jim. Yeah, I, I, you know, I'm typing emails. I'm like, Jim, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yeah. I'm going to have to call you Food One. <laughs> that's, that's fine. That's, uh, but yeah, I, I, I FedEx Cam, uh, this guy who's helping me with my, like my art dealer. I FedExed him original art yesterday because I didn't want to risk using the post office for international original art shipping. Like, yeah, I this point, this might not go out. It might get lost somewhere. So I'm, I'm just going to use FedEx and assume that that's. More yeah, more yeah, I think you're viable. totally safe with that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we were talking about Jim. You having the, the mailing operation home that's and just. It's, yeah, that's exactly what Jason's been doing. He's running carloads over to the the, uh, the post office every day. It's crazy. Yeah, I don't know what I would do differently, like, next time. You know, the, the Kickstarter was super – it's been very smooth. It's worked really well, and I feel like it allows me to kind of make anything I can think of making. But the fulfillment part, you know, like, I wouldn't fulfill another one myself. Certainly not on this scale but I don't know what the alternative is. Like I looked at fulfillment services and they're very, um, they're pretty costly. Like I think it would work if the object were bigger or the orders were less complex. Cause I ended up with, I think 230 different combinations of, of things. Oh, like, shit. yeah. Could you hire like a, like a, like a minimum wage, like intern. I mean, now's not the time to be doing that obviously, but I guess in the future you could like, I mean, I just, for me, like, I'd probably pay my kids, like, a, like a certain wage to just pack shit up. I think, I think that's probably the way I, I would do it, you know, so I was still kind of, like, near, near the operation and could interact with whoever's mm -hmm. doing it mm -hmm. and just hire, you know, whoever, friends that are in between jobs or, you know, relatives or something like that for a few days. Um, that's probably what I, what I would try next time. Again, assuming that you can have people like right. working closely with you and stuff too. I know, I know, it's madness. You can, madness. You're, you're gonna have to have your own like COVID test of people that show up. <laughs> right. <laughs> Scanning temperatures as they come in. <laughs> uh, yeah, that 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 may be uh, that might be necessary for a while. Yeah, I, I just got lucky with like our pop up book because my buddy Ross, who owns Proposition Press, he handles the distribution of the book through our Kickstarter. So it's like he has a house in Colorado set up with like the garage and the basement with just tables. And he's assembling these packages with the help of other people. And it's actually like an operation out of his house, man. It's like fully let's, happening. Let's plug your book here, Jim. Pop yeah. up punk. This book is awesome. That's amazing ridiculous dude that is so cool yeah thank you and did you print extras like can people order them yeah you can still get it at uh popupfunk.com um and yeah we're also ship it directly out to people so we definitely overprinted but we uh i you know we overprinted thinking that there there was gonna be conventions and yeah yeah i know i know I don't know when that'll happen again, but it's like, well, we still have books that people can buy right. through the website. So if you missed the Kickstarter, the Kickstarter though, you had all the incentives of like, you get all the extra like, goodies and stuff like that. 
Yeah, yeah. The shirt I got was red too. And oh, yeah. Jim, what about Jim Rugg? Your book, Octo Brianna. Do you printed extras, I assume, and is Ad House putting putting those out? Yeah, they'll be coming out even like through comic book shops relatively soon. Like they're uh, available available to order right now through comic shops to pre order. Um, I don't think I'm selling them anywhere online at the moment because I am in the middle of fulfillment. But once, sure. you know, once I send everything out to the Kickstarter backers, um, whatever's left over, then I'll put up online. But, you know, they're going to go through comic shops and stuff. If, if people miss Kickstarter or if they don't, you know, want to use Kickstarter for whatever reason, they'll be able to get them, you know, wherever they get comics normally. All right. Cool. That's awesome. So Chris at AdHouse did that through Diamond. Yes. Okay. That's awesome. All right. You, guys, you don't yeah. you don't upset retailers. I mean, not that they would be upset, but um, you know what I mean. It's like a weird thing of making a new comic, and then sometimes retailers are like, "So we don't get the book, or how does this work?" You know? Yeah, I I don't know if it's like the circumstances. I haven't heard anything from retailers. Right. to that effect but it could be because they have bigger fish to fry at the moment um several retailers reached out to me though because a lot of kickstarters will have that retailer level where i was gonna like, ask you, know, you about that yeah yeah and i talked to i have lots of friends that run comic shops so i talked to them about what they would want in a kickstarter you know like a like a retailer level package or whatever and they they weren't that keen on it period and you know like once you start offering these discounts on kickstarter like kickstarter's taking a cut you're paying for shipping right it gets really thin the, the margins there and so um that's why we're running it through diamond like after talking to some stores that seemed like the best solution to everyone and also um there are several retailers that we're just dealing with directly you know like if they reached out to me during the kickstarter i was like all right you know we'll sell to you directly like outside of the kickstarter or outside of diamond whatever works for the store because i mean you know i love comic book shops i'm a comic book yeah. nerd so yeah. it's it's basically whatever i can do to get it into comic shops i'll do whether that's like retailer direct or through diamond or you know whatever whatever works for everybody um i'm pretty flexible on that chris is flexible at ad house and there, you know, retailers, you, you've been in comic shops. A lot of comic shops aren't really interested in indie comics anyway, or they don't stock indie comics. So it's not like that applies to every comic shop either. You know, it's kind of a small percentage of comic shops that want this and uh, we'll work with them. You know, we'll meet them wherever it makes sense right. for them. All right. So, so far, so good. It, it's uh, I've heard from a few comic shop retailers and it's all been positive, but uh I don't know. I, I, I'm not under the impression, you know, it's such a small group that, that has access even to like a local comic shop. I don't know that Kickstarter is necessarily cannibalizing their sales. You know, I think that uh, we underestimate how many people are interested in comics. And like I grew up without access to a comic shop, you know, like lots of people don't have comic shops nearby. So I think there's a big audience out there for this kind of work. And, uh, you know, you kind of have to do that legwork to try to reach that audience all over the place and kickstarter is just one more outlet for that i think yeah yeah i'm, I'm i agree i'm noticing and feeling like more and more these crowdfunding uh sites are as as much of a marketing tool as they are a sales tool like that's definitely the way i looked at it yeah that's that's how i'm looking at it too for stuff i got going on all right, so let's do this. You guys want to switch over to the to the art jam session of this, and and we'll sure. keep the talk going. Yeah, sounds good. good. All right, so today we're uh, I mean we have Jim Rugg on obviously, and my man Ma Food, but we're going to be drawing Octo Brianna from Jim Rugg's comic Octo Brianna. So Very let cool. me switch over to mine. I've already started my uh, painting of her. You're a cheater, Sean. Dude, oh, man. I mean, You're I'm not going to get it done during the show. So. <laughs> but, yeah, I've got plans. I've got plans for this. Nice. And, Jim, you're starting to scrap both Jim's or Jim I Rugg. You see. have a pencil drawing done, correct? I did, yeah. Oh, my yeah. God, that's awesome. She's with a walrus? She is, yeah. That's uh, one, of the, uh, one of the original Octobriana stories, she fights like a giant uh, radiated walrus mutated giant walrus so 
Right. I kind of like, uh, I like drawing walruses anyway, and this is a good excuse for it. That's awesome, man. All right. So on that note, uh, Jim Rugg, t- tell us the uh, origins of inspiration for Octobriana. Well, it's two parts. One is the black light part, and maybe we'll come back to that. And the other part is the character, and she's been around for, um, I think, there was a book published in 1971 called Octobriana and the Russian Underground. Oh, and that was I real? Was... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was a real thing, dude. I thought you built this whole, like, fictional backstory. No, it's, it's a real thing, and it's kind of fantastic um, because it's, it's almost a history book. It's mostly text about this character that's supposed to be an underground Russian, you know, like dissidents were making this character and making illegal comic books about her. And it's all, it's a hoax, you know, it's not real, but it, it made her a public domain character. And so people have been using her in comics ever since, um, oh starting God. with like Brian Talbot. And so she's just, uh, she's the spirit of revolution. Oh, and, that's... you know, that it just lent itself to uh, a lot of my interest. I like these kind of like weird characters, you know, she's a superhero that we get to play with, unlike say Spider-Man or Batman or something like that, because she's in the public domain. Right. And, uh, you know, it kind of goes from there. Uh, the other part of it is the black light part. And I had made black light screen prints and I thought I could do this as a comic, you know, kind of using a similar approach with the color and I just needed the right project. And so I wanted something in the seventies, like black light stuff. And I was reading that book at the right time and it just all kind of clicked for me. It's perfect, man. And also Jim with, some of the just visual stuff I've seen you doing from the book, the interiors and stuff. It looks like Spain Rodriguez and Trash Man. I know you guys have done videos of, about him on uh, Kayfabe. That seems to be a pretty big influence on this as well. Yeah, that, that, that's a good call. I'm a big fan of his work too. And uh, it does line up very well. You know, like that's what I was thinking of where if the American underground cartoonist got hold of, Octobriana in the Russian underground in the 70s that you know this would be their response like to support their fellow cartoonist uh, underground cartoonist in Russia they would do their own Octobriana here in the states and that all went into like the head shops and the black lights and the underground cartoonists like Spain definitely I just got this one the other last week dude uh Subvert oh, Comics issue two it's a second printing but I have all the trash man stuff collected through Fanographics but I've been finding some of the individual issues of sub subvert out here. Portland has like really, really good comic shops for back issues. So I kind of want, you know, I'm on this thing of like, I just want the individual issues as well. Cause they've got something really cool about those, you know, like having the real paper and everything. Yeah. Uh, Guys real quick, just back up one second, educate me a little bit and maybe some of the audience on subvert comics. Jim, do you want to take that? <laughs> um, yeah, Subvert Comics was Spain Rodriguez's underground comic. So, you know, like some of these bigger underground cartoonists had their own titles that were, you know, a lot of them were anthologies, but some of them had their own titles that were their own characters. And Subvert Comics was his character, Trash Man, that was like a revolutionary underground um weirdly almost like part superhero but but clearly in the underground political sense of the word and uh another revolutionary character much like octobriana it'd be a perfect team up those two actually oh yeah and so i think three issues were published but there's also a trash man tabloid sized newsprint collection and a lot of those some of those comics are original for the comics and then some of them are collected from anthologies where it would appear like um the east village I think the East Village other is where those used to run. We've covered a lot of this on Cartoonist Cafe, believe it or not. Yeah. Um, you know, but it, these comics have like quite a history for that, that kind of thing. And they were pretty widely seen because they would appear in these all like tabloid news, newspapers, um, you know, like, like people would pick them up for, for the news part, you know, for the articles. And there would be these underground comic strips. Um, you know, so they and were pretty the widely seven, seen. What you guys are talking about? Yeah, mostly the 70s. Yeah, early okay. 70s, Sean. I think this this issue is like um, 72. 
Okay. Okay. Um, awesome. Um, and then uh, Jim Rugg, re real quick, just for some, I mean, I doubt this is the case, but for anyone who may not know that listens to this, talk about uh, Kayfabe real quick and, and let them know what that is, your podcast. K yeah, Kayfabe, Cartoonist Kayfabe is my YouTube channel that I do with another cartoonist here in Pittsburgh, Ed Piscor. And it's just basically all comics, you know, all the stuff that we love, the comics that we make, we talk about... Um, you know, process stuff. We talk about comics history and, and we've started interviewing people. So we've talked to people like Dave Gibbons, uh, Jim Moffrud's been on talking about his trip to Japan. Uh, you know, it's just, it's basically our love of comics. And of course, you know, there's a lot we love about comics. So it covers a pretty wide uh, set of topics and books. And it goes from like, we started out talking about Wizard Magazine in the 90s. And right. so there's a lot of uh, 90s comics talk but there's other stuff too, like underground coverage, manga, um, you know, you name it. We, we probably covered something close to it. And you're, you're like your guys passion and excitement for comics is, is obviously contagious because the, the podcast is wildly successful. It's, it's going well. And, you know, a lot of, we hear from a lot of pros and stuff, which is awesome. So like, we've had a chance to talk to all kinds of different people, um, you know, like like brendan mccarthy we talked to early on that one um, was amazing man i love that yeah yeah that yeah. Was, yeah and, yeah, it's, and Moffat, it's really we're, fun we're really enjoying the uh bakshi one. Oh yeah he was incredible man we weren't sure what to expect from him i think he's like 80 and uh he was just like sharp that? yeah, yeah incredible. life in him yeah yeah he was very animated well jim you know John Gibson from I Am 8-Bit, right? Yes. Obviously. Him and uh, Chris, I can't remember Chris's last name, from uh, the original Meat House crew. Oh, yeah. They, they, they did the Ralph Bakshi art book. They wrote. Yeah. And, and I remember John telling me at the time, Bakshi was pretty much a handful to deal with, with, with putting that <laughs> I book bet. It was like... It, it, became uh, a deadly game of cat and mouse just kind of dealing with him and getting him to sign off on things and um the book is incredible but john was like dude we we put so much fucking work into this and having to deal with with ralph and you know he's kind of a high maintenance uh guy but he's obviously a genius and a pop culture figure you know yeah like basically a legend in a way so uh well I'm but i know those those guys had to put in their work man like putting that book together i'm sure yeah i mean dude for us growing up i mean i remember discovering those movies that like to see that cartoons could be made for adults like that was just life-changing yeah yeah he he was fantastic it doesn't surprise me that that uh, you know, he, he would be demanding to work with or for, <laughs> but yeah. I also get real inspired by that. You know, like that's a guy who did things his way and just, right, right. you know, got it done. You know, you hear so many horror stories about how hard it is to produce something like, I mean, feature animation for adults, who else has even done anything like that? So, you know, to do that kind of work your way, I just find that hugely inspirational. For sure. Yeah. I agree for sure. Yeah, he was completely ahead of his time with basically everything he was doing. And uh, that was fantastic. I mean, I, you know, man, I started watching the videos, not to brag, but like with the very first video you guys dropped, just because <laughs> I know you guys, I consider you guys friends. I love your work. And I just thought it was going to be, I knew it was going to be interesting and like, funny to to revisit wizard magazine through your lens and then i quickly discovered what your <laughs> ulterior motives were with like okay this isn't just going to be about wizard now this is we're going to branch off and do other you know videos and then the interviews started and then once you guys got the mcfarland interview i feel like that was kind of the maybe like the breakthrough moment of now this is transcended into 
we're we're representing like comic books as a full blown art form and what the medium can be and and like interviewing the top the top dogs and and the the reason why the channel started one of the reasons is because of McFarlane and those guys in a way yeah, and you know, those guys have a lot in common with somebody like a, like a Ralph Bakshi too, because the, I just am inspired by these, by whoever goes off and does their own thing. Um, For sure. you know, whether it's changing the system or, you know, finding a new way to uh, make the system work for them. And, and those image guys, man, you know, they, they certainly did. Like whatever you may think of their work, they certainly changed the business quite a bit. And it was, it was because they weren't happy with the way things were, you know, they wanted more out of it. And it's like, they got it. Like it worked, you know, right. I'm sure that wasn't an easy thing for them, but from my seat, you know, that changed my whole dreams, what I wanted to do. Cause up to that point, I just wanted to, you know, draw Wolverine or something. And at that point it was like, figure out your own characters, you know, like then I wanted to make my own characters, my own book. It, it really, uh, like it literally changed my dreams, you know, the idea of those guys making their own stuff. Yep. So, yeah, I, I think that's definitely the case for me, but it wasn't, I mean, the image guys were exciting and, and I followed them and loved what they were doing. I think for me, it was more like seeing what Frank, Frank Miller go off and do that and Mignola do that too. Yeah. Yeah. I was reading like, uh, Miller was my favorite guy back then. Me too. And I started reading when he was in, you know, when he wasn't really doing comics there for a couple of years, I guess, whenever he was like screenwriting and stuff. And when he came back to uh, Sin City, I mean, that, that was my favorite thing on earth for yeah. a long time. Me too. That, that rocked me. That, that just, I remember like, and I, I talked to Shrek about this once. But I remember walking into the comic shop and this is like image era with all that new digital coloring airbrushed over rendered like just chaos and amongst the shelves of all this color there was like the most it just popped right out Sin City stark black and white simple graphic easy to read it it, it just it affected me as an artist from that point on clarity just like good graphic design and the importance of clarity was really understood to me. Definitely. And I also and, like that uh, he lettered that stuff himself and it, it had like a roughness to it. Yeah. That just gave me permission to, I don't know, keep doing the stuff I was doing, you know, cause like my sketchbooks didn't look like a Marvel comic or something or an image comic or anything that was all polished and, you know, computer color and perfect. But when I saw those Sin City pages, it was like, oh man, the lettering's a little bit, you know, it didn't look like a regular comic or at least what I was used to at that point. And it was really, you know, like I said, it was like permission to make comics that look like this, you know, letter them yourself. Don't worry about it. Right. Right. All right. Uh, Jim Rugg. <laughs> I keep having to call your last name out because <laughs> I have two Jims. Um, so let's talk about the blacklight aspect of Octobriana. What made you want to explore doing the blacklight stuff? I made uh, I, I make a lot of different stuff. So like I made some screen prints. Um, right, right. I can't remember what year it was, but they were blacklight screen prints. You know, it was like somebody had given me a chance to do a screen print and they're like, you can do, you know, whatever ink you want and stuff. And you realize like the blacklight is just, it's fluorescent ink is right. pretty much the secret to the blacklight. And so uh, that's what I did. And whenever the prints came back from the printer, I was amazed by the color. Like it was the greatest color I think I'd ever seen on anything. And so, you know, like my first idea then of course is make a comic with this. And it was right. purely because, um, you know, like I color my own comics and stuff. So I'm, I'm always looking at palettes and, you know, thinking of whatever looks good, you know, color wise. And as soon as I saw those fluorescent inks, man, I fell in love and it was just a matter of like, find some way to do this in a comic. Mm. And the more I researched it, no, you know, like I figured there would be underground comics that were printed that way. I couldn't find any, you know, like nobody really had done it. And so that's even better, you know, get right, to do it right. first is like, all right. Yeah. I was going to ask if that excited you even more. Oh man, that's my favorite stuff in the world is whenever I decide I want something and I can't find it, it's the perfect thing. Cause then it's like, make it yourself. Right. Definitely. And that was such a great way of like, 
I don't want to say like sales pitch, but it's also like being able to tag your Kickstarter and your post with the, the phrasing, you know, world's first black light. Right, right, right. That's a huge deal. That's, that's great. That's just, you know, not to be the business guy, but that's like just great marketing. Well, I, think you know? yeah, I, I think Jim Mopford, you've always been smart with the business and I learned a lot from you. So I, I think it's good to talk about that stuff and think about that stuff. But yeah, that's a, that's a marketing, a great marketing tool to have for sure. Yeah. It, it, it factors in when you're making your own st stuff, obviously. And it's right. You know, with like the pop-up book, I was calling it um, this just straight braggadocia, but just like the world's greatest pop-up book or the world's greatest psychedelic pop-up book. And right. it probably isn't the world's greatest pop-up <laughs> book, but fuck it. Like for younger fans of mine who don't, no or don't collect pop-up books like it, it is then like you know who cares it's just a way of, of like letting people know that you're confident in the product you're putting out it's something new it's something different why not hype it up that way you know yeah I yeah I, I agree 100 percent like so many cartoonists you know we we kind of sit around with our with our heads down mumbling or whatever and it's like you know if you look around at how other things are sold movies you know, whatever it is, no, you, you kind of have to put on that salesman hat. Um, it's, just, it's, it's how you get the word out. And, and Jim, like how much has things have things changed just this year alone with obviously, you know, what's going on, no conventions, whatever. It's like cartoonists now more than ever are being forced to turn themselves into somewhat outgoing charismatic people <laughs> that can go online, make videos, post on social media and be interesting, be unique, but then still have to deliver the goods as far as making the artwork, the product, the comics. Now you have to be like a guy that can also make videos and be interesting and charismatic. And I think that's got some cartoonists in a panic. Um, and I understand why I think all of us here are good. I know Eddie P is good. Cartoonist kayfabe is good. Scotty young is good. Oh, Scotty. But there, but there are certain people that are just like, yeah, I can't become like a personality now and have to make videos and all this other shit. Like I'm, I'm barely getting my work done every day in my studio. Now I'm supposed right. to go out and buy, mics and cameras and all this shit like this is a whole right. new right it's like a whole new era we're entering now um i i think it's i think it's offering people like us a, a new tool to use I, I don't know that i i'd say it's essential it's certainly like effective and uh if you're comfortable with it it's it's like to do this, like I'd be in here drawing anyway, but to talk to you guys while we're drawing, it's easy to incorporate into my daily stuff. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I guess one thing, one reason I, I, I was hoping to get Jim Rugg on and also reach out to Ed um, is like, I've been trying to figure out how to survive financially while getting out of the freelance world and into the independent world where I feel more comfortable and more interested in, in working in. And, uh, I mean, Mafud, you've been a big, I've, already, I've told you this, you've been a big help and a big inspiration. I've learned a lot from you, but I, I'm interested in learning more and more of how people do this. Uh, so that's kind of an ulterior motive to oh, sure. having Jim rug on today was to, to talk about that stuff. But so Jim you, rug, <laughs> <laughs> you're uh, uh, so Octobriana is the newest thing you've done. And that was a successful Kickstarter. A real, to me, it seemed like a really successful Kickstarter. Did, did yeah, that's fair. That yeah. Um, did, what were your expectations going in? You know, I, I, I try to keep it pretty open because it's the first time I've done a Kickstarter. So, um, you know, part of the reason that I worked with Ad House Books was this, a lot of the stuff I do, it's like, it's going to happen. 
regardless of whether, you know, like the Kickstarter works or whatever, like this book was going to get made. And uh, I, I try to kind of like, you know, not be dependent on it. So if, if it doesn't work well, I wouldn't be in trouble. Right. Um, you know, and, and like everything you're saying, Sean, I agree with, you know, in terms of like cartoonists making these transitions, promoting themselves, figuring out how to promote themselves, learning to make videos, if that's the direction they go. And I kind of approached the Kickstarter the same way. Like it was something new for me. I love doing new stuff anyway. And uh, it's something that I've wanted to do for like 10 years. So I didn't really know what to expect from it. Um, I think my goal was like $5,000 was my initial uh, goal for it. And we ended up doing, I think, around 95000 Yeah, yeah. Um, Amazing, man. Amazing. And, and I, I made mistakes. Like I accidentally launched it. 10 days earlier than I planned on launching it because I'm stupid or, you know, like, I, like technologically I'm, I'm challenged like a, a lot of probably uh, older cartoonists feel. So you and, hit the um, launch button by accident? Well, there, there was an approval thing. I thought I needed to do right. it to like get it set up so I could send out uh, previews to some of the people that, you know, like, like I'm talking to about it and I wanted them to kind of look at it. And I thought that's what I was doing, but it actually went live uh, uh, early. And there, there were things that I wasn't ready for. So I just, you know, I, I decided to leave it live and just continue doing all the preparation stuff that I had planned to do anyway. And, uh, you know, it, so there were, there were these little things that kind of went wrong, but ultimately worked out in the end. Um, but I, I, any of this stuff, like I just try to keep an open mind as much as possible and, and look at it almost like you get a new brush or something and you're just right. going to play with it. And that was a lot of what Kickstarter was for me. Like I, like I said, I've been wanting to do it because it was new distribution model, just something new to try. And I didn't have the right project until this time. So that's kind of how I approach all this stuff, including the video. Like whenever we started Cartoonist Kayfabe, it was just like, well, you know, let's make it fun for us, you know, talk about comics we want to talk about, you know, subject that we're interested in part of the reason we started it was because we would go to conventions together and just talk comics all weekend you know on the ride there uh at the convention on the ride home and we would always joke about like this you know this would be a podcast or something and uh it just kind of sprung up like right time right place and then the rest of it is we don't know exactly how this is going to go but if it's fun to do it you know that'll sustain us until we kind of figure out what we're doing <laughs> Right. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of making art, you know, like I always just want to draw what I want to draw and, you know, do stories that I think are going to be fun to make. I, I try to apply that to as much in my life as I can. And a lot of stuff fits that, you know, yeah. it's, it's, uh, it's the reason we all started making art. And then at some point it becomes a job and you can get, you know, it can become overwhelming if you're, if you lose track of that fun part, I think. And that's what, that's, that's my story right there. I, I, I got all wrapped up in it, lost track of the fun part, and now I'm, I'm getting back to it. But my, I mean, this podcast was born out of the same idea. I was like, I sit around at these conventions and like, we'll all get together afterwards and have these really interesting conversations. And I felt like that's something I could, I could do. Um, I wanted to ask you, did you decide to do the Kickstarter before COVID hit? No, no. The plan was I had two, uh, like two big books came out late last year and early this year. The, um, the Plain Janes, which was my young adult graphic novel, uh, came out in January, I want to say. And then um, Street Angel Deadly Girl Alive came out in November last year. And so I had like a really full show schedule plan this year, you know, like I was going to be on the road a lot promoting those books. Right. And, uh, and the, and the plan was I was going to do Octobriana without anyone knowing, and then just show up with it at shows. So it would be like a surprise wow. for, you know, people that came out to see me. And whenever COVID happened, you know, like we had already figured it out with the printer. We were just about ready to, to go with it whenever COVID shut everything down. Okay. And at that point, it was like, hmm, you know, what to do. And Kickstarter, I saw, was like still going well in terms of, um, you know, people investing in, in the different projects, but they didn't have as many projects going up live. And so, you know, it just, it just worked out. Like it just, uh, all these things kind of happened almost at the same time. And it was, weird to say perfect timing but i had a finished project 
it fit, you know, it, it kind of fit because it's a comic book, you know, it wasn't like a big 200 page book that I could really mess up, you know, uh, right, right, if it didn't right. fund or yep. something. It just seemed like it was a good size to try it out. How has, uh, has Kickstarter made you think more about how you're going to do things in the future at all? Like having such a successful Kickstarter? Yeah, a hundred percent. I think all the time about, um, you know, if you, if you follow my work, like I make some weird stuff and I probably maybe don't always make the best business decisions, you know, I'll make a book and then make a completely different book next. And, uh, what Kickstarter has done this project, it's sort of like whatever I can think of, I feel like I can make anything now, you know, yeah. like I don't necessarily yeah. have to convince a publisher or compromise yeah, you know, some yeah. part of it, it feels like I can just make whatever I want now. It could be a zine, it could be a book, you know, whatever. Right. right. Um, so I, I don't know, you know, like if I'll do another one soon or when or what it'll be, but I love that it's one more option out there, you know, options being traditional publishers, people I've worked with in the past, but also like, you know, do it yourself. It's, uh, yeah, I don't know. There's so many models for it. You know, there's so many ways to make make things now it's incredible yes yes and and i mean it th there's a like kickstarter definitely well everything i've been going through has led me to realize how how many options we have to be just totally free and independent with our with our work and fine yeah that's that's a good way to say it yeah there's so many outlets and so many ways to connect with with like a readership now it's it's really a, a fruitful time in that sense yeah, I talked to um, one of the guys we talked to recently, Pat Mills from 2000 AD fame. Oh, and shit. Did you interview Pat? Yeah. And, and, he, wow. and uh, it'll be up. Um, it'll be up tomorrow. Oh, and, okay. Uh, okay. Nice. Wow. He was talking about, uh, you know, putting the reader first. And I, I think that people lose track of that, you know, like, like I, I don't always hear people having that conversation or saying that, you know, like, like thinking about your readers, but we are so close to them now. You know, Howard Chaikin said something about that whenever we interviewed him. And this idea of like, we're just more connected, I think, to our readers than we've ever been. And right. there's something great about that. I agree. You know, it gives us a lot of freedom in terms of what we want to make and, you know, just, just having that readership. It's, it's, it's incredible. It's very freeing. Yeah. 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 That's exactly how I'm feeling. Um, That's I awesome, want, man. Let me let me see what everyone's doing real quick. Let's take an art check in. Mafud, speak so I can see your thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, shit, you're almost done. <laughs> yeah, that's straight, incredible. <laughs> straight to ink. Uh, Octobriana posing with her weapons and a gun and a strange psychedelic skull over here. <laughs> that's so awesome, man. It's like my warm up for the day. You know. That's awesome. And I can't Jim, believe how you can just go straight to ink like that. It's amazing. <laughs> it really is. It really is. Sometimes this fails miserably, though. Sometimes <laughs> it's it's not recommended for amateurs. You know. I was uh, packing up an art book yesterday for a, a rapper friend, and I I was like, let me do a little sketch on the outside, like Jim would do, and I just I was lost at sea with this pen on this on this package. I was like, how the fuck does he do that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then Jim Rugg. Let me, so, Jim Rugg, I see you're using a Raphael 8404. Yes. What I are, am. What size do you like to use there? This is a number two. Yeah, um, I'll be honest, though. I, I don't, I work with a lot of different stuff. Like, I'm doing this partially because, you know, I feel like your show is about inking, sort of, yeah. or drawing with ink. It's and good. so that's part of why I'm doing it this way. Um, okay. <laughs> but I don't do a ton of inking. Like, most of Octobriana I actually did with markers uh, on a light box over the roughs. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Wow. Um, wow. You know, so it really depends on the project. Like, I knew how that project was going to go from from early on in terms of, like, color and production. And so this step was just one step to get to like, you know, the, the, the finishing point, um, which the color was such a big part of. So I drew it relatively quickly in that regard. 
right. but it, it rained, you know, like it changes for everything I do. I did a bunch of um, Octobriana drawings for uh, like different Kickstarter backers. And I did them with ink and markers and paint and ballpoint pens and pencils and colored pencils and stuff. So, you know, I bounce around a lot with materials. Like that's one of the other things that has changed a lot since I started making comics is we can reproduce anything. Yep. And so I, I don't, I'm not that set on uh, like black ink on, on paper as right. I used to be, right. but I, but right. I did, I did for a long time, love it, you know, and I learned to use these brushes because I, I admired all these inkers. Um, so it's, it's still something I enjoy from time to time, but it's not my, I don't really have a standard way of working anymore. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, uh, that, that's actually a question I wanted to ask you. So stylistically, do you, do you approach every project differently? I mean, like Octo Brianna doesn't look at all like street angel to me. Yeah, totally, totally different. Um, and if you, if you have like the, uh, image collection of street angel, you'll see even those stories from story to story change. Some are in ink. One is completely digital from my iPad. Uh, some are in pencil, you know, so I, I just, I like, I like everything. <laughs> so it just, right. it depends on the story and it depends on my mood. But like, it almost like the hand that drew Octo Brianna looks different to me than the hand that drew Street Angel. Was that, was that intentional? Do you see that? Um, I don't know if I see that that much, you know, it's a very graphic style, yeah. the, that black light style. So, you know, I think stylistically it's, it's very different than the street angel stuff because the street angel stuff, it's a much more open line. Right. It's about, um, you know, like the color. It's funny cause they're both color projects, but the color is so different. The approach to color is so different between street angel and Octobriana. So I mean, I don't know, you know, it's, it, it, I, I do bounce around style wise, but I drew it. So I, I kind of, right. you know, like it feels like me to me. Even I mean, reading it, different. reading it, it definitely feels like you. Yeah. I'm, I'm not saying it doesn't feel like you. It just, I was kind of like, wow, what a cool idea to like, I, I don't know if I'd have the balls to just flip it up like that, but that might just be me seeing that. Um, and I, and I some of it. Go ahead, is, go ahead. is probably based on the color you know like That's the black saying. light effect you really need I, I think you really need a lot of black uh to make that work and so you know it's it's a very heavy heavy style in, in terms of how much ink is on a page so you know that might be where you're seeing a lot of differences that approach yeah, to like spotting blacks and that could be know. and that, that's what i was going to ask you next was that exact question because like as i'm working on this Dr. Brianna piece like I'd planned on doing a painting and I was like, I want to kind of make sure the painting feels like it's set in the world that you created for this book. And then I like, I've spent the past three days in my head, like how the fuck am I going to color like paint this? <laughs> I mean, I have like, I have some paints like Holbein makes a color called opera, which is that pink that I see in the book. And, and I have the blues. I'm just, how, uh, how do you decide how to do this and, and make it look cool or make it work? Was it just something you figured out on the fly? Um, like making those colors all work? Cause, Cause I mean, I could see how that could go horribly wrong with all these bright fluorescent colors could create like a visual chaos that would be really difficult to read, but you did not do that. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's colored, I color it digitally. So it's pretty forgiving. Like unlike paint, right. you know, I, I can color it. And, and if it doesn't work, I can get a sense that it's not working on the screen and very, very easily change that right. and make adjustments. And, you know, I certainly did. It's funny if you, if you kind of, um, I, I did a couple of other additions, you know, I did one that's like retro color right. and uh, it's, it's closely based on the, the black light, but oh. you'll see like there are different spots where I'm, I'm, changing colors you know like i change colors you know each time i would go through and proof it i might be like oh you know what that background should be different or the foreground should be different you know so like right i noticed that. It, it's certainly not an exact science um right you know you just kind of go with how you feel that day and i i think a lot of cartoonists are perfectionists and, and i am too i'm very obsessed with stuff that i i'm not sure anybody even notices right but i try to uh not be that way because I, I think it leads to 
unhappiness. Yeah. And yeah, so right. with a lot of this stuff, I just, you know, I, I, I understand that there isn't a right and wrong for how to color something like that. I mean, there might be something that's obviously wrong, but you know, if you're killing yourself trying to decide between orange and pink, maybe, maybe move on. <laughs> like, right. Right. You know, that's a good point. Let me uh, actually, that's an interesting point you just raised. Perfection leads to unhappiness. It, explain why you think that is because of what i just said like there's just not a clear you know like the binary system of of right wrong or this is this is perfect this isn't it doesn't apply to a lot of stuff and it certainly right. doesn't apply to a lot in the art world you know we're going to end up at the end of this episode with three cool looking pieces of octobriana that don't look at all alike Right. And, you know, you don't look at them and be like, well, you know, Sh Sean did this part wrong and Jim did this part wrong or whatever. It's like there isn't an, a, one answer for art, you know, and if you're seeking perfection or whatever, that's what you're looking for is the right answer. Right. What happens if there's no right answer? Now, what do you, you know, you, you drive yourself crazy looking for this thing that doesn't exist. Right, right. Do, do you feel like this is good? I'm trying. I don't know how I'm going to ask this, but do you feel like. True, there's no right or wrong answer, but like for me, I guess this is the best way to put it. For me, like the the process and the journey of, of creating art for me is I have this idea in my head of what I really want to communicate and what I want to learn in the act of figuring out how to communicate that idea. And I've spent so many years like with deadlines, like getting in the way of that, that, that the joy for me does come from, I, I guess saying trying to make it perfect is wrong. That's not it. But trying to get that, that vision in my head on paper, which takes time to figure out. So it's, it's not so much trying to be perfect, but um, trying to get what you're you're seeing close to what's on the paper i guess and i, I don't know i'm fucking that's always <laughs> that's always the ultimate challenge though right right but i, mean, I, I just never, i never get what i'm seeing in my head down on the paper it just doesn't. no it never gets there but you know what i'm saying like you, yeah. you try to get as close as you can to it and that's i i guess i was con trying to understand the difference between trying to make it perfect and trying to like carve that vision out as mm -hmm. perfectly as you can. Cause you're right. There, there is no perfect at all. I, I think it's important to, um, I teach a little bit. So like, you know, I'll see certain patterns repeated with students and then of course I'll see them in myself <laughs> and, right, and try to learn right. from that. And right. you know, like that's where I would see a lot of these ideas that I'm talking about in terms of perfection. But I also tell people, um, like I, I see people get frustrated whenever they try something new or they're trying to draw something and it doesn't look like, you know, what's in their head, especially like non-artists, you know, if right. my wife draws something, she's so frustrated with it by the time she's done and right. the drawing might be per like, I might look at it and be like, that's a great drawing, but it's different than what she had in her head. Right. And so she just sees that difference, you know, and I think a lot of people do that. I think it's important to be able to assess what you make because it's always going to be somewhat different. And, you know, if you're a professional artist and you do this for 20, 30 years, you get pretty good at like, I have an idea in my head and then it turns out pretty similar. You know, you, right. you know, the tools you've been, you've got your 10,000 hours in. Right. But I like that spontaneity and, you know, like a lot of good stuff comes out of the, I don't know how to draw, you know, this or that, right. But right. I ended up drawing right. it. What I did draw looks cool or something, even though it doesn't look like the, you know, the model of car that I, that I imagined drawing here, but it looks like a fast car or something. That's true. That's so I, I think it's real important to like, look at that thing that you actually made as objectively as you can. Like just because it's not exactly what your original concept was in your brain doesn't mean it's bad. It could be better. Right. You, know, you, you could be throwing out something great because it's not, you know, what you thought of you could be throwing out something better than what you thought of. Right. That's a good, yeah, that's a really solid point. Mafuda, I'm curious your thoughts on this too, because your work is so spontaneous. Yeah. I, I mean, I, um, I actually enjoy the image, not 
coming out like I imagine it in my mind because that surprise, that um, spontaneity is sort of the whole point of the working process for me, you know? So, so do you not, I mean, do you have a vision? Well, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, the, the most challenging thing for me is drawing, you know, the actual comic book pages because that's the most uh, preliminary work I put in where it's like, I'm writing it, I'm breaking it down thumbnails, storyboarding, penciling it, then inking it. That's the most thought and pre-planning I have to put in to, to my work. But like today, doing something like this, just pure fun, like kind of right. warm up, style, drawing straight to ink. I really enjoy the uh, not knowing where this is going or what the final image is supposed to be. Or it just puts like way less pressure on myself. Right. Um, right. But I'm, I also have a background of being a, a sketchbook worker. Like I've always been a sketchbook guy. Right. And certain artists just aren't sketchbook people. But I, I just came up in art school with, you just have a sketchbook with you everywhere you go. And yeah. I just always um, drew directly in ink in my sketchbooks and came up with uh, concepts and techniques and, um, so that's kind of always been ingrained in my approach of like, just, just make marks, just see where it goes. Like, just let it work itself out. And that idea I think could drive certain artists fucking crazy, you know, like, right. That's too loose. That's too spontaneous. That's, that's, um, it's too abstract, you know? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I had like, it's something I'm trying to get back to. I spent a long time, many years just always sketching in my sketchbook and experimenting uh jim rug do you keep a sketchbook like that no not really i i do keep a um like like a sketchbook but it's much more of a notebook it, it, it's i use it much more like a notebook than i do like a sketchbook although i do sketch a little bit in it but usually just very um like for rough story? little layouts or something like that is it for story ideas and stuff a lot more story ideas, a lot of just, you know, day to day, like my list of what I'm doing or what I need to do or notes from a meeting and stuff like that. You know, like it's, right. it's just a handy place to organize information for me. And I do sketch in it a little bit, but not, you know, like you see guys with these beautiful sketchbooks. That is right. not what I have. It's mostly illegible notes. Let me ask you, cause I see you're working, you were just working on the pants a little bit. Um, is there a, do you have a definitive design for Octobriana? Like, so like I remember some pals where she was in like these leopard skin pants and then somewhere she wasn't. Yeah. Um, I, I do try to put her in snakeskin pants. Yes. That's what, um, yes. Snake skin, yes. Yes. That's what it was. But I, I don't have a particular like snake. I'm trying out a new snake pattern here today. Okay. okay. Uh, <laughs> nice. You nice. know, I mean, I asked because I want to put her in some. Well, go ahead. Go ahead. One of the things that, um, that Jim mentioned, you know, like all the planning and, and, and kind of stuff, I struggle with that sometimes, especially because, you know, like, like him, I, I, Pencil. I usually do everything myself. So, you know, in the course of making a comics page, that means looking at it in rough form, thinking about it whenever I'm writing it or something, looking at it in roughs, looking at it in pencils, looking at it in inks and in colors, and it can get really tedious. Right. So, you know, the spontaneity or, you know, leaving some of this stuff out so that I can fill it in, you know, maybe when I'm inking or whatever, it's really helpful to me to stay engaged with it. Uh, you know, if, if it is like, if you saw my pencils, they're so rough, um, you know, they would make no sense. If you handed them to an inker, they would just, you know, they would want paid to be a finisher or something because of right. how incomplete they are. But I, I kind of need that so that, you know, the fourth time over this page, I'm still interested. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. I could see that. Yeah. It's, uh, it's interesting that everyone has their own, approach to all to this kind of stuff you know and, and by the way my approach was different on the last book than it will be on the next one and it was sure. certainly different you know five years ago and just from this conversation like you know you you pick up these little ideas that are like oh maybe you know maybe i'll try that part out right so then it's you you mentioned briefly your process on octobriano was you did some pretty rough uh like 
would you call them thumbnails? And then you inked on a light box right from those? Yeah, I, I, a uh, couple things. First, one of the things I'm putting together is a process, a digital process zine that has every step of what I made in it. Okay. And right now it's, it's 400 pages right now. Oh, shit. Um, oh good. So oh. for, uh, that'll probably come out in a couple of weeks, but that'll answer in great detail, any of these questions. Okay, um, but the way that I worked is, uh, I did my layouts on an iPad. I made like a template with, um, uh, in Photoshop and that's what I would draw on. And that was just to keep all the sizes right and everything. And right. then I would very loosely do my layouts on, on my iPad and then print that out and then light box that. So, you know, like it's, it's very loose pencils and I don't have them around here easily. Maybe if, if I get up, I'll grab some and show them to you. Okay. Um, but they're very loose, you know, depending on the information, like whenever I pencil, it's kind of like, if I know how to draw whatever it is, like it might just be a line, you know, like an outline or right. just to have the shape down. Um, and then if it's something that's a little more complex, then I might pencil it a lot, you know, a lot, there'll be a lot more information in my pencils then so that I know what I'm doing when I get to ink. Uh -huh. But I would print that out and I would uh, light box it. And I really like the light box stuff. I, I started doing that with some of my Street Angel um, books because I was drawing in pencil and I needed the pencils to be very clean. Right. And the way, to, the way I would do it is light box. And I, there was something about that that was very fun. So I've been using the light box more for that kind of thing. And that's what I would do my like finished line work just over those rough layouts that I printed out. That's how I did Octobriana. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, that was my next question was I was going to ask, how is it different than Street Angel? So with Street Angel, you would thumbnail and then pencil and then ink? Yeah. Um, gosh, you're really testing me now because the, <laughs> the Street Angel stuff I would do, each, each issue I would do differently. Um, but I would do oh, some, okay. you know, I would get to a point where I had layout pencils, you know, something with, again, enough information that I could do like the finished art. And then uh, for some of them, I would light box them, you know, with that like, rough pencils basically right. put a clean sheet on top and then that's where i would do my finished drawing okay okay nice. and that was with pencil okay like if i'm inking usually i'm i'm you know like this i usually have some marks on the page like some pencils or something okay um where jim rug let me ask you where are you are you from you live in the pittsburgh area now is that correct yeah, I grew up near here, like an hour okay. south of here. It was okay. rural, but it's basically the same area, southwestern Pennsylvania. Okay, because I hear in your voice an accent that sounds familiar to me. and Because I most of my life was spent outside of Baltimore. And I Yeah, that makes right. sense. Yeah, I mean, I hear it. It's like in Philly, I hear it. In areas of Delaware, I hear it. And in Baltimore. And it changes a little bit, but there's... There's some words that are unmistakably that area. That's what I was asking. And, and Jim, you said you didn't have uh, access to a comic shop as a kid, right? So you were just like a newsstand, grocery right. store kind of thing, kind of situation? Drug stores. Uh, flea market is where I started finding stuff that was a little better than the spinner rack. Because there, there was a guy that, that was like um, the baseball card market had had turned into like a comic book market. So oh, yeah. I would find guys at a flea market that would have some decent stuff. Nice. Okay. Mafu, you know all about those flea markets. I love them. <laughs> You've told some them. stories. Oh, man. <laughs> about your pops at the flea market. Yeah. Well, that, yeah, I mean, I've told these stories before, but St. Louis, where I grew up, like we didn't have, we, the comic convention we had, I say that like, in quotations it was just a swap meet style show you know oh so that was a convention you were talking about yeah yeah but but oh i mean it really God. was it a convention right show? right but just i didn't even know what a convention was till i was like 20 yeah i mean these these were called uh the culping house convention and uh it was just a st louis like swap meet at a shriners hall sundays only like i think four times a year Wow. And, and it was guys just set up with like, you know, folding tables, uh, selling old comics. But that's how conventions started. Like that's, that's what they were. 
Yeah. I mean, my first convention I went to in D.C. was that. Yeah, it was. Uh, but man, I mean, at the time I was collecting um, G.I. Joe and Ninja Turtles comics. And that's the place where I would find back issues of all that stuff. Right. And and that's where, you know, my dad would be like the crazy guy and, and <laughs> be uh, negotiating. <laughs> Jim, my dad used to like scare awkward, nerdy comic book uh, kids at these shows and like can, you know, negotiate with them and, and get me these incredible deals on comics. That's amazing, man. You know, I would have like a stack of books that were like 50 bucks and my dad <laughs> would just like pop out of nowhere and 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 grab the books and be like, we got... We got 50 bucks here of books. We'll give you $10 in cash for this right now. And the, the kid selling the comics would be like, uh, but it's like, it's like 50. My dad's like, yeah, yeah, we're, we're not paying that. We'll give you 10. And then they would start negotiating. And then my, they would finally give up and I would get the books for like 20 bucks as opposed to 50. So Man, that's my amazing. dad, my dad was like, a. a crazy i mean he's still alive he's awesome but he's a he's a back in the day it was a crazy <laughs> middle eastern like salesman type guy and his whole thing was like you don't you don't pay what they're asking you negotiate that's the whole point <laughs> right like that's the whole right. point of this open market like swap meet thing is they list these prices and then you say no to all these prices <laughs> just throw out your own like crazy ridiculous <laughs> offer and most of these guys were so awkward and uncomfortable by this like middle eastern man yelling at them <laughs> that they would sort of give up halfway through the negotiation and be like okay 20 that's fine whatever and then they'd look at me like, just get your comics and your fucking crazy dad and get out of here. <laughs> and that's so, dude, awesome, I made, I, that's how I completed my collections, man, of G.I. Joe and the original Mirage Studios Ninja Turtles run, which, Jim, I know the, all, the, the, the Ninja Turtles especially have a soft spot, spot in your heart and Ed's yeah. as well. But um, let me show you how near and dear they are to my heart. Oh, shit. Oh, that's great. Is that brand new? Yeah. Wow, that looks... Uh, dude, show that again real quick. <laughs> real quick. That That's fantastic. Yeah, that's awesome. Oh, that's great, dude. It looks like you had so much fun doing that. Very fun. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah those that's... characters are awesome to draw. Yeah. Yeah, I think... That's, that's fantastic, man. But, you know, that was a specific era, and um, last time I was at home in St. Louis visiting my folks, most of my childhood comics collection is still in their basement, and I wow. found all the original Ninja Turtles and Mirage stuff, man. Wow. And I, I, shipped it, I shipped it all back to Portland, yeah, so now I, I have it. Thinking, I'm trying to figure out where mine is right now. I remember getting Fish Police and Ninja Turtles. Yeah. Fish police. Dude, I loved fish police. <laughs> <laughs> I would draw the shit out of that all day long. I don't it's know. so funny, the stuff that, that comics have produced over the years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, Jim Rugg, another question I wanted to ask you. Um, do you approach... I know we talked about like the style of drawing, but... Aside from that, the the design of the storytelling, do you approach that differently from project to project? Because there are a lot of really interesting devices I thought you used in Octobriana that I don't um, think it's used before. Or do you sort of just approach it to not like everything, just what feels right? Probably kind of everything, you know, what feels right. Um, one you know like that's what i love about comics is you can do almost anything so it's almost like whatever i think of if i think that'll look cool or that'll work or that'll solve some you know problem that i'm trying to you know make sure that readers see this or understand this or that right um you know like pretty much anything's on the table most of the time unless 
you know, there's probably sometimes whenever I have more specific rules in mind, but for the most part, it's like anything goes because, gotcha. you know, like when I was a kid, I loved all the Marvel DC stuff. And then I got sick of that. And I, and I found like all the alternative stuff. And then it was like all that and no Marvel DC stuff. And then at some point it was like, Oh no, I still like looking at that. Right. And it just became like all my comics, like street angel, whenever it first came out, it was a combination of all these things that were like, you know, part, part Frank Miller and then like part Dan Klaus or something. Right. And right. it was strange at the time, but now I feel like that's kind of where we're all at. It's just, yes. you know, whatever yeah. you're into, yeah. put it, put it on the, put it on the page. Yeah, I agree. I, I think like, I think Jim and I have talked about this before, but I feel like creatively we're in one of the healthiest places I've seen comics in America be in. Yeah. And I, I yeah, think. anything goes. And um, I don't know if you guys watched the uh, brand new sci-fi documentary on McFarlane. I haven't seen it yet. It's on um, Sci-Fi it Network, either. Jim? What's that? It's on Sci-Fi Network? Yeah, but it's on YouTube as well, man. You can just... Okay. Okay. I mean, it's like an hour, but uh, it was cool to hear even McFarlane, the Todd father, say, as far as talent goes, <laughs> there's never been a better time than right now. Like, right. the amount of just sheer murderers that are working in the industry and, and and posting on Instagram and doing their own thing. Like the level of draftsmanship and just pure drawing skills is being pushed to like another level. You know, I mean, just think of all of our friends we know from like, I know Kennedy to Daniel Warren Johnson to Trad Moore to uh, Ian Bertram to Mike Huddleston to, yeah. The three of us, you know, in this video, it's like th there's there's some magical stuff going on right now. I agree. I totally agree. Yeah. And by the way, you can also then jump continents or uh, go digital, you know, web comics and stuff there. It's happening everywhere. You know, it's not like it's just uh, American comics that are having this kind of right incredible creative period. And, you know, it's not even just comics. I think it's it, it has to do, I think, with distribution and, and somehow with the internet and distribution. Because if you look at like stand-up comics, right? It used to yeah. be, there'd be a, a couple of people that everybody would know or, you know, you would all run out whenever something new came out. Now it's like, I don't know, there's 10,000 of, you know, if, if we really sat down and tried to name all the good cartoonists or all the talented artists we know, you'd have a list in the thousands. Yeah, and in the 90s, yeah. it was like, yeah, there's 20, you know, there's maybe yeah. 20, and we can all mostly right. agree on them. I think it is the internet. It's absolutely, and I think, it, like, the world is a much smaller place, and you can, your work can reach an audience it never could have found in the 90s because of the internet. I, I mean, like, it used to be, I think, you had to work for a publisher, and that's how the world saw your work. But then again, it was just people who went to the comic shop for the most part and saw it. Now it, with Instagram and the, the world's just so small, your work can reach some kid in Guam who's never picked up a comic before and never yeah. been in a comic shop. And I, and yeah, and if you go back like 20 more years, it would be that you had to live in New York because, you know, like even pre FedEx, you know, right, like right. it was such a small pool of talent that would, you know, Marvel or, or DC would have access to. Yep. Right. And also back then, man, you know, obviously before social media, email and all that, if you lived in New York and your face was a common sight at the Marvel and DC offices, that means probably more work for you. You know, you, you needed to go oh, to yeah. like lunch with these editors, mingle in that social circle and just kind of remind people like, Hey, I'm here. I'm, a, I'm working. I'm a freelancer. I'm around. Uh, you hear of old timers stories just like, yeah, I was just hanging out in the Marvel and DC right. office. And someone asked to look at my work. And that led to some... He thought I got his first job. I remember hearing that story. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, you know, just shit like that where it's like it mattered where you lived. Um, yeah. I thought as a kid that I had to move to New York to work in comics. You know, that was my... I did too. I did too. My goal It's like when I grow up, I'm going to move to New York and work for Marvel or DC Comics. That's just how it works. Right. 
Yeah, I mean, you, you probably had. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like, just getting discovered not living in New York must have been so hard. Yeah. Speaking of Howard Chaikin, wasn't he... Was he part of that, like, Miller, Sinkavich studio in, in New York? Or is that Vermont? Am I, am I getting... You're that? remembering correctly. On my, like, when I interviewed Howard on my podcast, we, we talked about all that, and like, like, his peer group, which was, yeah, those, those people. Yeah, was, yeah uh, that, that studio that those guys, you know, and I think it, it changed over the years of who was there. But, man, the guys that came through that studio, talk about a murderer's row of talent. Oh, if, if we were listing, like, our top 20 guys from then, I think they all went through that, that area. Because I think Bill Sienkiewicz was there at one point. You know, yeah, I think guys would yeah. come and go, so maybe they weren't all there at the same time. But, man, a lot of talent through those through those Yeah, uh, that, through that, that generation studio. was crazy. Crazy gifted generation. It's it's probably a good thing, but just out of my curiosity, it's like it's crazy. It it sucks in a way that there's no documented footage of a lot of that stuff. I mean, we all live on our phones and have video of everything now. Right, but right. I, I remember when I was living in LA. Uh, I was at a drawing session with Sinkavich, and he was telling me that during. Electra Assassin, when him and Frank were working on that, he went to LA for a while and was crashing out on Frank Miller's couch. And they were working on the book, going out, partying every night. What? Coming home at night, and he would sit down and like rearrange panels and, and figure things out. And it, and it was like him and Frank were in the same house for a period of that making that book and it's like wow. could you imagine if that had been documented or if that if there was like video of that or and it's just it's just kind of lost to the ages and it's just bill's memory basically of him well i feel like with podcasting we can capture some of that well we can now yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i th think we we need to but yeah. uh Go ahead. I, I want to I want to see what that was like in '85 or '86 of those Mad Men together, <laughs> like making this this crazy book together. That would be incredible, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's one of my favorite books, and Me too. whenever I uh, like, I, you know, we we've talked to Bill Sienkiewicz on the show, and I get the impression like whenever that thing came out, it wasn't maybe well received. <laughs> Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And, and it's almost oh, like it's, really? it, it's scarred him or something. Um, you know, cause in my mind, it's this, like, it's 1986 that, you know, like Pantheon year. Right. And that's one of those important books that has stood up and, you know, looks Wait, great. That was 86 changed. also. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God, dude. What didn't come out that year? It's, it's amazing. Like, like you're spot on, you know, thinking that's the time to document or because it was almost like, something was happening you know the fact right. that all these people were just hitting on all cylinders at that time but i do think that book history is has, has changed you know like when it first came out i think people had no idea what they were looking at and were like i don't know man this is this is weird yeah right right it's it's interesting jim because like uh Bill was telling me that I, I think he was disappointed in the in the format of it being released as a normal printed floppy comic by Epic Books. Like Dark Knight Returns and Watchmen seem to have uh, you know different production value and and the right. higher quality um, that square bound kind of prestige format that right. the original right. Dark Knight had and yeah. I think Bill was a little disappointed by how Epic handled it. And, and then, yeah, the individual issues weren't, um, weren't really, the, the response wasn't quite there. And it wasn't until like a year or two later or when it was finally collected that people were like, this is a, this is a masterful piece of art. Like this is fucking incredible. Um, it also upon initial release it all at once. Like if, if you got that thing, you know, two issues in or whatever you would be scratching your head because oh, yeah. it's, it's such a that it's such a graphic novel 
Right. You know, like that's a weird term, but I mean, like, it's impossible that you would read issue three of that and it would make sense. You right. know, like you, right. it really is a book, even if they published it as comics. You know, it's such a complete work as all eight issues that it probably had to come out that way for people to, you know, have a little better understanding of what they were looking at and make sense of it. Yeah. That's a good point. Especially yeah. since, like, think of all the attention that Frank got for right. Dark Knight Returns that year. There's, like, articles in Rolling Stone magazine. And the mainstream right. press is sort of covering it. Like, comics aren't just for kids anymore. And then Electra Assassin isn't really included in that list that much for some reason. It's always, it's always Dark Knight Returns and Watchmen. And then maybe sometimes Mouse is thrown in there as, like, the third. Yeah breakthrough thing for that that year basically um but for me man it's like electro assassin is the most interesting of all of those for me you know visually i agree that that would be my if, if i were going to read one of those right now electro assassin would be my first choice yeah i i've got to stick with dark knight returns yeah that's still that that was my entrance to this and it's still my holy grail no, I get it. I get it, dude. It's still... Jim, Sean and I did like a Dark Knight Returns episode where we did drawings of Dark Knight Returns while talking about, you know, the book and... That's a good idea. How, That's how, awesome. How good it is and how it just... It still stands up. Like, just yeah. this incredible... Rereading it was such a treat. Yeah, we, we did... Uh we did a review of it too on uh, cartoonist kayfabe and and saying you know and also like just being able to talk to other fans of it is so much fun mm -hmm. i miss that that was something that when i did get access to comic book shops was always the best because you know like there weren't that many good books so everybody kind of knew the same ones and had read yeah. them or if something new came out we'd all read the same thing at the same time i miss that part you know like it's one of the trade-offs like if I were going to make this complaint, the complaint would be there's too much good stuff, <laughs> which is <Yes>. ludicrous, <laughs> but it does have an effect. You know, it's very rare that a book comes out and everybody, you know, like all my friends have read it and, you know, people at the comic shop have read it and you get into these conversations. So it's so great whenever you, we get to do that. That that was one of my favorite things with Dark Knight recently was just having a chance to reread it and then talk to somebody about it. Oh, Yeah. Was it just you and Ed talking about that? Tom Scioli was there, too. Oh, okay, okay. He's John, a real fun guy to talk comics. John, you have to watch the video because Tom Scioli, <laughs> no offense, Jim, but he sort of comes out as the star of that. Oh, yeah. Of that video. Oh, no. He drops all these nuggets of wisdom and references and metaphors that are in the book that I never realized all this strange psychosexual stuff with Batman and the Joker that uh -oh. I was like, wait, what? That is what uh -oh. that, oh my God. <laughs> it's, um, it's insane. And it's, it's amazing. I, I had a blast watching those videos. All right. I gotta watch it. I gotta watch yeah, it. It's great. Um, before I forget, Jim, I wanted to ask you, what was your first exposure to uh, comic shops then? Like, how did that work out? You know, it's probably around when Image started. And around that time, like I, maybe, I'm not sure the timing's exactly right, but I also got my driver's license. And so then I could go to one that was like, maybe 45 minutes or an hour away. Sure. And the thing that that did was, you know, at that point I was into indie comics and that's where I would found indie comics. Cause I would read about stuff like in comic scene magazine or something, but have no, you know, I'd never see it anywhere. And whenever I finally got to this comic shop, it was a pretty good comic shop and it would, they had everything. Like that's where I found Faust. It's where I would get like the Mirage turtles. Um, you know, whatever I had heard of, they pretty much had, and they were black, you know, like the black and white comics were so big to me because I had no idea how to color anything. I was just working in black and white and it looked like what I was doing and it was interesting. And it just really, I don't know, re reignited. Cause you know, I was kind of bored with the other stuff that I was seeing at that point. And it really kind of reignited it because it was like, here's a whole new bunch of self publishers and weird books and rule breaking right. books. And 
it was huge. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. It's a uh... man. That first time you walk into a store and it's just nothing but <laughs> yeah. racks of comic books. Like I, uh, yeah, I remember that. God damn. That was a special, special thing, man. I remember it was walls and walls of like, I'd never seen a long box before. And it was just like these stacks of these long boxes. And then Where was that? you could pull the lid off those and just dig through the crates like that. Oh yeah. Yeah. What is this place? <laughs> Were you collecting like monthly comics at that time, Sean? Uh, yeah, when I first started, like I first, I read Dark Knight Returns. I got into comics later. I was 15. Someone gave me a copy of Dark Knight Returns. And it just was like, whoa, what the fuck is this? I want, I want more. And so I, I, I was in like Hebrew school at the time. And I remember like my best friend was a girl named Rachel and her cousin was Ryan. And we were like, we were good friends. And Ryan was another artist who wanted to do comics, but Ryan knew comics. And I'd never mm-hmm. even been to a comic shop. So he had just got his license and we like got to Hebrew school and he was like, let's go. And we cut and he drove us like 20 minutes away to this comic shop. And that's where I discovered it. So yeah, I just started buying floppies and the ones that I was interested in, I just stuck with. And and that's right. when I learned about the pull box and all that stuff. So yeah, I kind of jumped right into it. You cut Hebrew school to go to the comic I know, shop. I that's know. I was <laughs> uh, Jack Kirby would be so proud of you. <laughs> I got did no, when I actually, actually Jack might be upset. Howard Shakin would be very proud of you. I got to tell <laughs> Howard the story because my dad comes to pick me up, and uh, I get in the car and he's like, "How was Hebrew school today?" I was like, "Ah, it was boring, same as always." <laughs> And he's just like, he at this point, the ra- <clears throat> sorry, the rabbi had called him. So he knows, but he's a lawyer. So he's just, he's just giving me rope to hang myself with. And the more questions he asks, the more lies I'm telling. And then he's like, actually, we have to go back. And then he walks me back to the rabbi's office and the gig was up. <laughs> That's oh, hilarious. Shit. shit. Oh, man. But yeah, I don't know if I've told this story or not uh, somewhere, probably, but uh, I would get comics like wherever I could find them. You know, it was like I was like a like a like a fiend or an addict or something. And I would find like listings in a newspaper. And whenever I got Howard Chaikin's Black Kiss, it oh. was like I, I was 16 and I would just drive all over the place, like people's garages and stuff. And so I got to this place <laughs> and it was kind of a bad section of the town that I lived near. And up in this dude's attic, and he's selling me Howard Chaikin's Black Kiss. Oh and I had no God. idea. I'm just looking through this long box, you know, and shouldn't have been there, probably shouldn't have survived it. But uh, <laughs> it, all, it all worked out okay, but it could not have been a more lurid place to find that comic. Right. <laughs> Seems like the perfect place to find it. it yeah, for, for sure. <laughs> oh, wow. He's like, hey, I also got... Uh... <laughs> Faust comics kid. You're like, I already know about that. I have to go. <laughs> yeah. I remember the first time I saw Faust. That was a like a mind blower. Yeah. That was just another dimension, you know, because it was one thing yeah. to have like the mainstream turn into the hyper detailed like McFarlane, Liefeld, Lee era of the early 90s. And then I was kicking it with, you know, Lorenzo and the Artline Studios guys in St. Louis, and they were all older than me. So I couldn't buy Faust, but Lorenzo would buy it. And then I would see these comics, like in the back of the comic shop, he would just break it out and show it to me. And I'd be like, this is fucking crazy that this (laughs) exists. Like, I saw Faust comics before I saw Robert Crumb. Oh, wow. I mean, really, no, if you... I think I did, too. I think I did, too. But if you understand the legacy of, like, lurid, adults-only comics, it makes sense to start <laughs> with Chrome and, and, and right. 60s underground kind of hippie stuff. It's like drugs, sex, you get it. But to not know any of that and then just go directly into Faust where, like, people are getting their dicks cut off. Right, and, right. 
disemboweled and it's this gorgeous incredibly detailed rendered drawing it's hypnotizing and also like completely disturbing at right. the same time totally um so one I, of my I, favorite things is hearing that everybody knows faust <laughs> you know like like whenever that would start to come up in conversation with other cartoonists and like every cartoonist knows that book it, it just blew my mind how 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 much that book got around yeah dude i haven't told this story i don't think ever my so when i was 17 like my senior high school my girlfriend got a job in a comic shop and i just she would just rape the place and bring me stacks of everything and that faust was in that that's hell a, yeah got into my faust. that's a that's a pretty wild way to get faust like having your girlfriend give it to you i know i still don't know what she was doing in a comic shop so, yeah i was gonna ask like did you 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 actually dated a comics no she got the job because of my interest in it okay okay like she was did she, you marry her that sounds no, like a, uh, <laughs> no she and she didn't really read them she just she was like a hot chick who worked in a comic shop she got a lot of attention and um she she wanted to be an artist and uh she knew that like i like showed her all the all the comics and all the art and stuff and I don't know. I guess I, I don't know why she decided to apply there, but she did. You know what it was? She was working in, I know exactly what it was. Now I remember. She was working in Express, the clothing store. And like I would go oh, visit God, her wow. during lunch break. And then I'd be like, let's stop in the comic shop because it was in the mall. Mm. And then like they got to know us from popping in. And the manager definitely crushed on her. And I sure. think like one day she went in there to pick up my books and, and he offered her like, Hey, if you ever want to work here. And, and then I think he offered her a lot more than express was paying her. I think that's what it was. If memory serves. So this is like early nineties, late, late eighties, early nineties, late eighties. Yeah. 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 Wow. Express dude. I haven't, <laughs> yeah. I haven't thought about that since, uh, Remember the mall? That, yeah. That was a, <laughs> yeah. That was a huge, I mean, especially in the Midwest where I grew up, the, the mall was like the, the, the big thing, man. That was... Oh, for sure, where I was too, no doubt. Yeah, yeah, same. It was always great whenever, uh, during a speculator boom, like there, there would be shops would open in the mall. And that was the best having access, you know, just more comic shops everywhere. But right. it was always convenient when they were in a, in, a, in a mall. And that's exactly what this shop was. It was that boom. And then it all collapsed later. But yeah, it was, it was uh, in the mall. And I have, and I still have it. I think it's in my attic here. Like the entire Marvel card set with the holograms and everything. Oh, yeah. She she got me all that shit. Is that the one that uh, there, there, there's a set that Jim Lee like drew every card, right? Not that's my the X Men card. Okay, the okay. X Men set, and that is a cool. That's a cool set. I think he inked them with like Sharpie markers or something. Yes, almost yeah. like the um like the two sided Sharpie, you know, that has the fine finer tip on yeah. one side. Exactly. Right. right. Yeah. Because those I mean, are great. I remember me and my friends at the time being such nerds that we were like, Scott Williams didn't ink these. It's just Jim Lee. <laughs> but the fact that he inked them himself and with just kind of like that dead line, it's just like not really much line weight. I still like that style of his a lot. You know, I, I don't think I've seen these. I thought that was a cool look for him. And it's like, if this is Jim Lee rushing things, He's still a bad motherfucker. Like he's still. I amazing. like all of his drawing outside of comics better than I like his Me comics. Too, that's exact, yeah, I agree. I feel like, like my thought on Jim is he's a great artist. I hate his aesthetic. Mm. Yeah, it, it's very tight, you know. Um, and I think that's deliberate. I mean, obviously, it's super popular. If, if you're going to hire Jim Lee, that's what you're hiring him for. 
But man, the, the stuff that he does like on somebody's drum kit or warm ups or yeah, right. you know, like these videos of like sketching and drawing, he's phenomenal. Like it's yeah. so much more interesting to me than that really tight yeah. and I get it, you know, again, people love it and, and it sells, but personally, like I love seeing his other you yeah. know, more more out there stuff. Me too. And even in the like the heyday of that look and, and Jim being like the the like hot X Men artist. He was not my favorite in that that school of artists at all. Yeah, me either. It's um, it's weird to say that it's too good, but uh, I like the weird stuff, and I, I kind of need. I I don't want perfect art, you know. Like if it's too accurate or whatever, it's kind of boring to me. Yeah. So well, okay, this is interesting. Interesting conversation. Where are you? Does Art Adams' work interest you at all? Yeah, I like his stuff pretty good, but I don't think if yeah. his is that perfect. It's very okay. he has cartoony elements. I like oh, that okay, stuff. I understand what you mean by perfect now. Okay, I got it. Cool. Art is. It's still... the same with all those like '80s black and white indie comics. Like the the more competent you are in a way, the less interesting the comics are. Yeah. 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 It's like that love that that certain amateurish aesthetic makes the work more charming in a way, or more interesting. You yeah, know? yeah, I can see that. Yeah, I can definitely. See and that. also, as as a you know, as a young artist looking at that kind of stuff, it lets you know that you can do this shit one day. You know, you can. If this guy can do it, it's it's like well. I'm not too far away from this. You know, what else do I have to do to get to just this level? Yeah, I think that a lot. Like where maybe part of the reason I like it is it is inspiring because it looks like I could do it. <laughs> right, right. I don't mean that in an arrogant way either. I just mean... Yeah, I know what you mean. I totally know what you mean. In, in a practical way. It's, there's like, a it's like hearing like, uh, like the Ramones and saying, I, I, could, do, I could make music. Right. That's exactly right. I was going to say it's, it's very much like punk where it's like anybody can do this. Mm -hmm. Jim, one of the things I like when you guys talk on Kayfabe about the image era, you've mentioned it in different videos where you guys say the, one of the coolest things about the Liefeld McFarlane era, especially Liefeld, is that work looks like the work of the best kid in your high school class. Right. Yeah. Right, right. And, and that, that's inspiring because it's like, well, wait a minute. I think I can do that. Like, I probably can't draw like Neil Adams, but this new batch of weirdos doing this hyper liney, detailed work with incorrect anatomy. It's like this, this resonates more with a younger teenage kind of um, angst ridden want to be cartoonist you know right right yeah i i think that's part of the like their inking even has that quality because it looks like it's done with a pen or something yeah. you know the brush being this that's exotic true. that's true. perfect line tool but those their stuff was like oh yeah man i can do this you know i can do this with my uh uniball or whatever i i think that that's that you know i stand by that i think that's uh it's a, it's part of the, part of that work. It's funny because like hearing what you guys talk, like I went in such the other direction where I was like, I have to learn how to use the brush. I, I have to like like seeing that people were using like like microns and pens and stuff made me not want to use them because I, I don't know. I wanted to I wanted to take the harder route to get that look. I guess right that that I was more. Sean, that, that happened to me once I got to art school where I was like, okay, I, I want to learn the proper way to do all this, the brush and, and everything. Right. In high school, it, it was sort of like, hey, if, if, you know, if Liefeld can do it, like maybe all of us can do it in a way. You right, know? right. It just seemed more attainable. I wish than I could. Yeah, I get it. Like, I, like I'm trying to remember, like, I think I thought Liefeld was a really good artist back then. Like, I mean, I loved McFarlane. I loved, I, I liked Liefeld a lot. I can't say I loved him. 
Mm -hmm. but I was really into the work of like what Mark Silvestri and Dan Green were doing at Marvel. Yeah, I like those guys a lot. Yeah, Yeah, that's some really pretty stuff. And Art Adams was my favorite. Like everything he did, like when he did that Fantastic Four run where it was like uh, Hulk, Wolverine, Ghost Rider, and Spider-Man were the FF. That's a great run. That blew my mind. All the X-Men annuals and the Mojo stories they did, like Art Adams was like the Holy Grail. Yeah. I, I think... I think I, I don't think I saw the flaws in Liefeld's work until like college when I was starting to study art more. <laughs> right. I think that's I think that's funny. And then it's just like, wait a minute, what what is this stuff? <laughs> right. This is uh what were we thinking when we were like 15? Right, that's exactly right. Do you guys remember seeing Mignola's work for the first time? I remember him doing that fill-in on X-Force and yeah. not appreciating it. That's exactly <laughs> how I felt, too. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was a fan of Mike's before that because I was collecting DC stuff in the 80s. So he did some fill-in issues on, like, Superman, where yeah, it was, like, Superman the... versus uh, the Banshee. Yeah. And then I bought Cosmic Odyssey when it came out. Oh, um, dude, that book. Oh, my God. That book. And that book just blew my mind because it was so strange. Like, I didn't know it was really... I didn't understand that it was Mignola doing, like, a Kirby thing. Right, right. But it was just so cool looking that I, I had to get it at the time. And uh, Mignola was controversial between me and my friends because some people just didn't like his work. My my One of my buddies was like, he always draws people with big like fat faces <laughs> and like he would render he would do like a top and bottom lip on the male character right i remember that yeah 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 and at the time <laughs> a lot of mainstream comic artists just weren't doing that so even back then mignola had his own um language for his style even though he wasn't really yes. inking his own stuff for sure at that time sure. he had a uh, already developed like this sort of language that he was doing that's for sure dude it's funny today jim i was picking out um i just was collecting pencils for what we're going to do on tuesday yeah i like i started to come across like a he-man he drew and it was like the most unglamorous like unsexy (laughs) he-man i'm like only mike would do this and and then i got to like his spider-man villains and they were all like so wonderfully and oddly proportioned for sure yeah and it it made me that's kind of why i asked the question because i remember seeing that x-force issue and being like huh but now i'm like oh my god it's so charming i love it oh it's great it's yeah, that's so, that's a, an incredible issue. And it, it's there so, uh, it's so there rare. are layouts for um, Rob Liefeld did layouts for that issue, and you can find those online, which I always found pretty interesting because it looks like Mignola's, you know, like it it looks like he's doing everything, but it's pretty faithful to the layouts. And where it differs from the layouts, it's very interesting to see that too. Because, oh, you know, for the most part, it's like Liefeld was, you know, has given him the storytelling part of it. Wow. That's just crazy to think about. Yeah, it's weird. That's really weird. It's like, do Mignola purists know about that? Do they know that? <laughs> I, I don't know. Mike, <laughs> thing, Jim, Mike stuck true to Rob Liefeld layouts? That's a, <laughs> it's an incredible thing to think about. <laughs> Funny to refer to them as purists. Yeah, I, <laughs> I like the idea. Purists. Of- there's there's this group of Mignola purists. I like that. They're they're out there. I mean, yeah. it's ironic too, man, because I consider Mike to be one of the best like storytellers. Yeah. So him having to follow anyone's layouts, much less Liefeld, is sort of yeah, that's crazy to me. Like laughable if you think about it now. Yeah, totally. I think that's probably just how. Um, like how Liefeld was writing that book at the time, oh, you know? Right, right, right. I guess. I, I don't know. It's neat, though. And like I said, you can find them online, so you can do the comparison for yourself, and it's just kind of cool to see all of that. You know, right. like it's, it's, it's a funny mashup. 
Do you guys have the uh, Hellboy in Hell artist edition? No. I do not. Uh, oh, man. I'm so glad I brought this up then. Well, you, you should uh, rush out and get it. Okay. It's great. That one's... Here's what's so great about it. It's not, the lettering's not on the boards. So it's this wordless version of Hellboy in Hell. And oh. it reminds me of like um, Jim Woodring's Frank. Oh, yes. where it's just Hellboy wandering through these incredible landscapes of, of hell. Oh. And it's so good in black and white. The thing that I never understand about how he works is that he's able to get three layers of depth with black and white. Yeah. Right? It's, it's very peculiar. Yeah, yeah. It, I'm not sure which artist edition it was, Jim, but I saw... I think a different one that Mignola did with Hellboy and it was fantastic, but his originals are so clean and precise that it was almost like it didn't need an artist edition because what you see is what you get. Uh, yeah. If that, if that makes sense. Like with my artist, yeah. edition, I, yeah. I want to see the white, the white out, the painting, the mistakes. The, and with Mignola, it's like, well, these pages are all, perfect it's just right right it's just in black and white like i mean this is cool but uh he's so good that i'm not seeing like all the hidden magic uh, necessarily but i have not seen the hellboy in hell one i'll i'll, I'll check that one out that sounds awesome I have, you know what i saw his pages before that book came out like like before the book came out um i was somewhere and, and he had pages so we were looking at him and it's a very thin ink that he like spots the blacks yes, with, at least yes. if, if my memory's right on these pages anyway. In the uh, artist edition, it looks like they've maybe increased the levels so that it is more of a flat black rather than like seeing like the wash, kind of the wash like fill. Mm, and okay. that bothers me, but purely as like a comic book, it's my favorite version of Hellboy in Hell. Like it, it reads in that format with no words and in black and white. And it's just right. this gorgeous. It's also like at scale, there's something powerful about his work at that full scale. Like it's yes. almost uh, I, I, like, it's like the ideal size for it or something. I don't know. I was, I was pretty impressed with it. Usually I'm, I'm like you, Jim, I want to see all the blemishes and, you know, secrets and marks and stuff. But this one is almost like, think of it as a graphic novel rather than a um an artist edition and it's just a pleasure to sort of read you know compared to like you know like the mazzucchelli daredevil was amazing for looking at yeah, process i love that one i love that one uh, it's, it's very different to hellboy and hell but it's it's its own thing and it's it's pretty spectacular for that part awesome. i've got the uh the screw on head artist edition and and in that uh, Jim Rugg, you can see all the like the the thin inks, like the almost yeah. like, washy look of everything. And I mean, talking along those lines, like it, I won't even use an ink like that. Like Jim, you like my originals look like the pay, like they're the same thing. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's my obsessive craziness. There was a um, Jack Kirby artist edition that Mike Royer inked. It might have been the first one. It was like a, a New Gods, I think. And I had that reaction of, it looks like photocopies. Like, like Mike Royer's so, you know, his inking was so precise. Right. But it's very flat blacks and super clean. Nice to look at, but not, not like the artist edition quality of, you know, right. weird discolorations and Oh, for sure. Stuff. I mean, if it was up to me, I would own every single artist edition that's been made. It just becomes a money issue and a storage issue with those things. Yeah. I mean, they're all, yeah. Most of them are all they so do. beautiful. It's, it's like, yeah, you don't have to twist my arm to, 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 to get, get me to go get that. It's just, uh, what, what section of my house do I need to build a new wing onto to store all these... Uh, artist edition books right man i hear that i still have to get those kelly jones ones that you have mafu oh yeah jim rug if you haven't seen it the kelly jones batman artist edition is out of this world i haven't seen that one it's, i'll have it's to look nuts, for it man when you look at it in that format it's um john Beatty inking 
Kelly Jones when they and and to think that that was a monthly Batman comic in the mid nineties. <laughs> It's incredible. It's, it's unbelievable, dude. It, it's like um, completely surreal. Like some of it's super psychedelic, crazy proportions, you know. Um, but it looks like they're having a blast drawing this stuff. Uh, I always show it to people that come over to visit, and it it freaks everybody out. Yeah, it was it was beautiful. <laughs> it's like crazy shit. That's cool. I need to come over and look at it. Mm. Anytime, man. You know, it sucks because, dude, I was planning on going to Pittsburgh this year just to hit all the comic shops out there and do some digging, see you guys, go to Ed's house and do, like, you know, the official on-set, on-location interview with Kayfabe. Yes. And then... uh I mean, obviously, we're in the place we're at, but <laughs> it's still on my list, man, because I, I only been to Pittsburgh once, and it was when we were on the set of uh, Dogma. Oh, yeah, it, we'd we love to have you, man. Hopefully, all these stores survive. Yeah. Are you – I'm still going to the comic shop once a week out here in Portland because there's so many of them out here that I love and want to support. Are you – I know you're super busy with the Kickstarter. Are, uh, the, the stuff is still open, at least in in Pittsburgh. Yeah, most of it. Most of it's still open. I I don't go out very much for anywhere, but um, it's you know like none of the big stores have closed. Yeah, you know the local big stores. So I don't know how well they're all doing, but they are all still you know fighting the good fight. Definitely. I, and a lot of them are doing um, online sales and stuff like that. So I have bought stuff from them that way. That's cool. Jim Rugg, I wanted to ask you, because you, you started off the show, and I, I remember I made a note of this, um, saying you have a lot of love for comic shops. And, and we've kind of talked about them a little bit throughout this, this show. Um, uh, what are your feelings on like what is it you have a lot of love for and what are your feelings on the i like i mean right now i think what's happening right now with covid is is it's accelerating problems that were already there and we're seeing the shops like starting to disappear possibly from this um yeah. Uh, what, wait, what's the question there, Sean? <laughs> the question is, uh, like, so, like, is is evolution killing the comic shop? And I know, like, we have a nostalgia for that, but it, is this something that you think will just, evolution will take, like, the evolution of, of this industry and this medium, we'll see it disappear. And what do you feel about that? Man, I, I hate to say that, but probably. You know, I think the model of comic shops is not going to work for a million reasons. Um, earlier when I was saying, like, there's too much good stuff, that's a real problem if you're a retailer because what do you order? And then, you know, if, if I show up and I'm looking for whatever book and they don't have it and I leave, you know, I find that book somewhere else. And so I think that, that there's just a lot of uh, challenges facing comic shops. I even think calling, you know, like thinking about them as a unit is even a mistake because mm -hmm. early on, uh, like when Diamond was shut down and there were a bunch of, uh, you know, conversations about that, I remember seeing a stat that I think it's 10% or no, it's 10 store. The top 10 stores account for, I think, more than half of the direct market business-wise. So if there are like, say, oh, 2,000 wow. stores and 10 of them do, you know, as much business as the other 1,990, it's weird to even think of those two groups as the same thing. Like, they just right. aren't the same. So, right. you know, like, we've all been to lots of comic shops. They're all very different. Every shop I've ever been to is totally different. Mm -hmm. They're like these entrepreneurial businesses. And uh, right. I right. think some of them will survive and right. adapt. And right. some of them maybe will just, you know, be done with it. Um, 
I don't know, man. It's, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how it goes. Mark Miller's written a lot of, or, or talked a lot about what he sees in the near future. And he yeah. expects the comics industry to really be strong a year from now, but much smaller, you know, oh, yeah. many fewer titles and things. And he's basing this on like the history of comics. There are like 10 year cycles and, you know, of like kind of creative boom and then contraction or whatever and he feels like we're on the cusp of that next real big creative positive period and i like hearing that and i mean you know there's so many good cartoonists working there's so many good books coming out figuring out how to sell them is a challenge but you know if you have the good material i think the model for selling it will emerge but it'll probably be different you know it'll be a lot of different little models like kickstarter like um one of the best comic shops I know of is Copacetic Comics here in Pittsburgh. They don't have a diamond account. And it's still like the best comic shop in the world. That's really? Odd. You know, so like so, he buys from Ingrams, he buys from all these different sources, he buys from creators and small distros and stuff. And he knows what he's selling really well. So people come in and he's able to very quickly talk with them and, and point you at stuff that you don't even know existed until you, you know, until you walk through the door. So I think there are other stores like that. Um, I, but I, you know, I mean, who know, I don't know really anything about retail. So it's hard for me to say too much about this and, and actually know what I'm talking about. I just don't. Right. But that's amazing, man. His model, copacetic, that should be the model for... Yeah, that's that's really amazing to hear. That sounds incredible. Yeah, it does. Wow. Well, uh, and you know, Mark is par- partially right because I'm, I'm sure you guys heard this week, like DC fired all these people, and and what they're doing though is they're they're, you know, killing half their line of comics because no one's buying this shit. Right. So what's going to happen? It's going to go back to like the '80s again, where it's like there's only one or two Batman titles. There's one or two Superman titles. There's they're, they're, they have to trim all this fat because sure. People dig Batman, but do you really need 14 Batman titles every month? No, that's stupid. It's fucking greedy. It's right. like get rid of this shit, make it give Batman two really great books and, and have it, have it be that that's, that's it. That's all you need. Right. Right. Yeah. I wondered, um, Daniel Warren Johnson is doing that uh, Dead Earth Wonder Woman yeah. series. Yeah. And it's it's fantastic, man. He's yeah. great and it's great. It's really but in good. my mind, it's like, why isn't this Wonder Woman? Why isn't this just, you know, six issues of Wonder Woman or whatever? Right, right. right. It's a good question. Because it's, uh, it's incredible when you think like Batman Year One was four issues of Batman. Right. Yes. Right, yeah. Yeah, Born Again was just, you know, however many issues of Daredevil. Right. It's, yeah. I, I, you know, if your books aren't selling well, like, you know, put the best efforts into those books. You know, put put these mini series and stuff that are really good and do seem to have, you know, traction, put those into the regular books. Yes. And, you know, it's interesting, man, because, like, I know the corporate people probably cringe at that idea, but at the same time, if it's just Daniel Warren on the regular Wonder Woman title, it's only six issues. If it doesn't do great, right? six issues are up, you bring in an, a fan favorite artist and then they're happy again. But at least you're experimenting, trying new things, you know, seeing what happens. But again, that's us as artists talking. I know corporate people, when they hear like experimenting and this and that, they're right. like, no, right. we, don't, we don't do that. Like, right, that's, right. That's, right. That's crazy talk, but uh, yeah. you gotta. I, I wonder a lot about the whole comic book format because it's it's a pretty obsolete format. You know, it was it 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 exists because it was the cheapest way to put this stuff out. It hasn't been cheap forever. You know, it right, hasn't been like right. a, a good economic model. It's just like uh, right. cool. momentum or you know clinging to what what was rather than adapting. So there might be room for that to change in some way. Sure. You know, you could still do comics when they make sense. Like, like with Octobriana, I love comics. I love that format. So here's a story that fits that format. You know, it's, it's 24 pages. It fits a comic book. But if it were 200 pages, like, I'd probably just do it as a book. Right, right. Yeah. 
Yeah, Mafu and I, we've talked about this a lot, a lot, a lot. Yeah, trying to figure out, like, um, just format and approaches for the future. And, um, I mean, I'm working on a new Girl Scout series. It won't be done until next year. But it's one thing Sean and I always talk about. It's like, I don't even know if I, like, should I just kickstart this thing when it's completely done next year and sell it directly to my fans? Should I still go through image is the direct market. Do they want this kind of book? Like, you know, we, we have options, which is exciting, but it's also kind of like, how do I read the landscape of, of, of what's going on and do what's best for my work and, and, and getting it out there. You know, it's, um, it's kind of interesting, you know. It's weird that we have these conversations as much as we do now, too, because nobody talked about this stuff 20 years ago no. around me, at least. Right. No, and, not, uh, at all. not at all. You know, like now, you know, it gives us a lot of creative freedom. When we talked to Ralph Bakshi, that was something that, that, that he talked about because, you know, like his work is so unique and singular, but it's because he controlled everything. You know, he delivered on time. He, he, he worked within whatever budget he had. You know, it was like being in control of the business side of it allowed him to be super creative. Right. You know, and, and I, I feel like that's been my experience making stuff, but it is different. Like it does take time away from sitting at the drawing table, you know? Right, right. You have to be a business person too. Yeah. Or you have to have a good business person somewhere on the team with you. Right. You know? I don't know, man. I, you know, I, like I said, I, I don't know that there's going to be one answer for any of these questions. I think yeah. it's really going to be, it's going to vary from publisher to artist to stores. I think it's going to be a lot of, uh, you know, maybe a lot of just options for everybody. And, and then you right. know, readers can decide if they want it on their iPad, if they want it as issues, if they I want mean, it as graphic novels, whatever. My thought for like my first like independent creator own book is I'm interested in the idea of putting out chapters as like comics for your phone, but collecting the entire story at the end in a nice, beautifully packaged, like oversized book. Yeah. That's one idea. I like that idea. Yeah. And people engage with this stuff in a lot of different ways. You know, like there are people who are only going to read it on a phone and there are people that will only read it on paper. It's right. not, you know, it's right. not like an either or it's kind of right. like, exactly. Exactly. I actually, I, I like that part a lot. You know, the idea that you can package this stuff in these different ways and with print on demand and all the different things that are out there, you know, it's not like you have to have, a 40,000 print run for something to be profitable. Right. Exactly. And, and I do think like with like something like Kickstarter, you, like the idea that we can cut out the publisher means we don't have to sell as many units to, to make some decent money doing this. Exactly. Right. Yeah, it's kind of like the sky is the limit. It's just figuring out where you, as an individual creator, fit into all this, you know? Right, right. But, I mean, we all did Kickstarters this year, and they were all successful. So I think that that's a, a step in the right direction. Like, that's a good For sure. sign. For sure, I agree. I definitely agree. All right, so where are you guys in your pieces? Because I've got a lot of work I gotta, I'm going to have to do after the podcast on this one. I think I'm about done. Oh, that looks great. Awesome. Oh, you Those are both looking amazing. Zip up on there. Nice. Nice. And what, Jim, what are you starting? Mafu, you're starting a new piece? <laughs> Start starting a second piece. <laughs> I have this so far. That's this, unbelievable, man. This is like my crazy mixed media now I want you to do an Octobriana comic. I want to see the whole, the whole story of this. If you write it, man, <laughs> collaboration for uh, 2022. Yeah, maybe you heard, you heard it here first. Do it like an <laughs> anthology, an Octobriana anthology. Oh, shit. That's an idea. Yeah, I thought about, uh, like, you know, there, there, were, there was a lot of dreaming going on with the Kickstarter, and one of them was trying to get other artists to do blacklight stuff with me because it's kind of a weird process yeah but uh 
Yeah, I just didn't, I kind of ran out of time, but that, that was on, that was in my uh, list of things that would have been cool to do. So there may be more in the future. All right. I'd be into that, man. That's, um, that's a whole, yeah, it's like you're introducing a whole new printing technique and that kind of, that can be fun with uh, deciding how you approach the work, you know? Yeah, I like that. I like that aspect of the book too. That's awesome. It was a lot of fun. All right, Mafud, um, before we like cut out of here, is there anything you were hoping we asked Jim while he was here? Uh, or you feel like we covered it? I think we covered a lot of good territory, man. I'm. Uh, I just had a blast hanging out with you guys drawing. This is definitely, like definitely my Saturday warm up uh, drawing, and you know. All right, cool. Uh, Jim Rugg, is there anything you were hoping we to talk about we didn't, that we did not? You know what, man? It, it went pretty well. Like, Jim, it, this is fun. I, I don't do a lot of this, uh, you know, drawing with people uh, on video like this. So uh, it was very, very good. I, I appreciate it, man. Thank you. All right, cool. Well, thank you so much for doing this. Um, you, uh, uh, so you can't, like, say where people can get Octobriana right now, right? That, that's not available. That's going to take. Uh, they can order it right now at their comic shops because it is in previews okay. now. Um, okay. So okay. that would be the best place to go. Um, otherwise, you know, they can just kind of follow me. I'm Jim Rug Art on Instagram, and and uh, I will certainly post as soon as it's available anywhere else. Okay. Awesome. All right. So I'm going to hit stop on the record real quick, and then we can chat a little bit and say our goodbyes personally. Sure. Thank you so much for doing this, Jim. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Jim. Thanks for having me, Sean. This is awesome. Awesome. This is the Pulp Podcast. This is the Ink Pulp Podcast. Comics. Hip hop. Life. 